Well, good afternoon. Welcome to the third space age. I'll tell you what I mean by that in just a minute, but I, first I just want to say thank, thank you, uh, Maria, thanks for the introduction, and Pete, thanks for being the MC here today. Uh, thanks to the uh, Space Foundation for putting on, a, a, again, it gets better every year, Space Symposium. Um, hey, so some of you had a chance to hear from my boss, uh, General Dickinson, yesterday morning in the keynote uh, for the symposium. And um, you also, if you were stuck around along uh, enough time for dinner last night, you got a real treat in getting to hear from our senior enlisted leader, uh, Master Gunnery Sergeant Stalker. Master Guns is here with us. And that was, that was terrific, Master Guns. I left really inspired. And, and, and I have to, have to listen to the deputy um, here at lunchtime. Uh, but I, I feel like I, someone needs to be recognized here within the command, because you're from the commander, the C-cell, and, and I'm myself. But really, the person that really makes things happen in the command is our chief of staff. And Rear Admiral Will Pennington is also with us today. Will, could you just stand up and just wave to everybody, please? Right. Will's a super Hornet driver, a terrific leader, a warrior, but maybe most importantly in his job at Chief of Staff, he runs the headquarters. And that enables General Dickinson and myself to have slices of space time where we can think about what is space? What does it mean? and gives us a little bit extra time. So thanks, Will, for all the work you do to, to, to run the headquarters. Appreciate it, good to have you here. Hey, what a crowd and what a symposium. I was, I've been trying to count. It's over 20 symposiums I've been to in my career and they just keep getting bigger and more diverse and better. And uh, let's not overlook that. And I, I just also want to recognize Admiral Zellibor, sir, for your leadership here. I think your last symposium. I mean, uh, Heather's going to have a heck of a job ahead of you, but uh, thank you so much for your leadership. It's been a terrific symposium. <laughs> He's thinking, not out of the woods yet. Got another couple days to go here before we get there. Not thinking that. Um, but hey, so why? Why do we have so many here? from all the sectors within space, from civil, from commercial, from national security. Why are, we, why are we all here? What are we all focused on? What's special about what's going on right now in the space domain? And I thought, you know, uh, I thought General Salzman gave a great talk earlier today, hopefully you all caught that, and he talked about it being a new era, right? He had, he had a great narrative, I think, to try to describe that. We've, we've heard it's a, maybe it's a second space age, or space race, a second space race, right? Or, or, or maybe it's the golden age of space with all the commercial activity that we have going on right now. Um, I'd, I'd suggest to you maybe another way to think about it because I think it comes on the end of it, a good why, why we should care, and that is welcome to the third space age. And what do I mean by those ages? Well, let's talk about the first space age. Starts with Sputnik and goes until the end of the Cold War, right? And the focus in space during that period was almost exclusively national security. Yes, we had Apollo, but that was really a national security program in many ways, even though it was civil. And then we did a lot on the national security front with regard to missile warning and, and, uh, and, and spy satellites and moved that forward. And commercial remained fairly nascent in that period. Started to pick up in the 1980s, but fairly nascent. That was the first space age, space age. And then the Cold War ended, and we saw a, a, a definitely an inflection point and change in all of the sectors. We'll start with civil first, right? We didn't go back to the moon, but we did routinize travel to low Earth orbit with the space shuttle. And we eventually teamed with our Cold War adversaries with the International Space Station. Anyone had a chance to hear from Dan Golden what a treat this week, right? Either Sunday night or some of you were maybe at the lunch he was at yesterday. What a treat to hear his perspective uh, during his time of the tenure at NASA when that was happening. Okay, but we, you know, so we just, and then we, you know, the International Space Station root, routinizing flights to low Earth orbit. Uh, commercial really took off in a different way, right? I mean, you had a lot of things happening. There were new SATCOM systems, there was, leveraging GPS in a way that now is endemic to our society with across the planet in ways that we never could have envisioned at the beginning of that second space age. 
And then on the national security front, and again, uh, I think actually uh, Grub Bratton did a great job talking about that this morning at the breakfast in here. What we really did with regard to space from a national security perspective is we drilled down to the tactical level. Where it had been primarily strategic in the first space age, we got down, got it down, get, getting those case, space capabilities to the warfighter in whatever domain they were, land, sea, or air, as best as we possibly could, optimizing GPS, getting the best satcom services and such, integrating into operations across the spectrum. That was the second space age. But perhaps the most remarkable characteristic of the second space age was the environment was benign. Even in the first space age, we had some confrontations with the Soviets. We even tested an anti-satellite missile and intercepted a satellite, created debris, and said, oh, we better not do that anymore. That's a bad idea. Nobody should do that anymore. Second space age, all the threats went away. And much of our approach was just how do we kind of leverage the domain for the terrestrial domains. But now let's talk about the third space age. I think it starts somewhere in the 2015 timeframe. And we've seen some nonlinear changes across those sectors. From a civil perspective, we're going back to the moon, folks. That's pretty exciting. If you saw Pam Melroy's uh, presentation yesterday, how could you not be excited about that? And then from moon to Mars, right? And, and, and we're, we're going to go, we're doing this. We're doing this. And it's going to be permanent presence. And it's going to be exciting. From a commercial perspective, wow, have we seen an explosion in, in capability and, and, and new ways of doing business that really would have been a stretch of the imagination back in, in the early, two, early 2000s, the first decade of this century, right? Proliferated low Earth orbit constellations of many kinds, reusable launch vehicles. The use of commercial services in ways that are now seen by the entire globe. I mean, we all saw the imagery provided that was on the news during the invasion of Ukraine last year, right? The Russian convoy backed up for 40 miles outside Kyiv or the, the, uh, the towns in, in which atrocities took place. And that was all declassified NRO footage, right? No, it was commercial ISR that was showing the world what was going on and, and, and what, a, what a tremendous change we've seen there. And then national security. We continued to do all the things we've done before at the strategic, the tactical level, to integrate space into the terrestrial domains, but now we face a threat. And that is perhaps the most dramatic change of all in this third space age. But here, here's the real so what. All of the sectors are now connected in ways they never were before, that they never were before. Who would have, I mean, it's now routine for us, but who would have thought even 15 years ago, that NASA would have contracted to a commercial company to take astronauts to the space station. I mean, for the younger folks here, you think that's normal, right? That, that was actually a stretch in a paradigm. What, we're gonna contract that out? They're just gonna drop them off at the space station? That's gonna happen? So there was a connection between commercial and civil in ways we haven't seen before, and that's growing. The connection between civil and national security, particularly uh, I'm thinking about NASA, but it all, also involves our partners in Department of Commerce and such, um, is tighter than it's ever been before. We are not putting astronauts and same back to the moon without the support from US Space Command, General Dickinson's role as the DOD manager of support to hum human spaceflight. And we are teaming with NASA to be able to do that to make sure that those activities are done as transparently and as safely as possible. And then commercial and security are interwoven in ways that I don't think we're ever going back. It's conceivable that our commercial systems may be under attack because of what we've seen already in Ukraine or what they could contribute to national security efforts in the future. We're all in this together now in ways we've never been before. We're all in it together. I call it the conjunction of the space sectors. Conjunction, it's a great space word, right? Goes back to Greek astronomy, right? When two, two celestial bodies came close in the night sky. It's great, we should love that word. That's what we have here with all of our space sectors. So no matter what sector you're working in today, we're all in it together. And in some ways, that's intimidating. In some ways, it's really, really exciting. So let me talk a little bit about some, uh, on the national security side, this is a space warfighter luncheon. Uh, as you well know, and it's been said many times already this week, two interesting organizations stood up in 2019. 
And I think, I just, just to step in back for a second, man, we're lucky we did that. If we were trying to stand up Space Force and US Space Command today, given all the change we've even seen in the last three and a half to four years, we'd be much further behind than where we are today. And I don't have time to give examples of that, but that, I, I really truly believe, truly believe that. We did that. It, it might have been a little need to need or just in time, however you do it, but we should be thankful that we did it as a nation. And Space Force has done some terrific things. I thought, uh, again, Secretary Kendall's speech today and John Salton's speeches were great at showing what the service is doing and moving forward, growing as people, growing capability, thinking of doing different things. We have a space development agency and a space rapid capabilities office that we didn't have before that are bringing capability forward. And I think it's probably still in the early gears. We're still shifting into higher gear with Space Force, but I think it's heading in the right, in the right direction. And I'm proud to be a member of Space Force, to be a guardian. And then there's U.S. Space Command. And we have been growing. I can say from personal perspective as the deputy, you know, I came in and in late 2020, we were still kind of just trying to, get, trying to get desks for people and trying to get our systems hooked up and trying to be able to receive and issue orders, the basic things that a combatant command needs to do. And then, but I had a chance to, a front row seat to watching it grow. We hit IOC in the summer of 2021. In fact, the General Dickinson made that declaration at the, at the Off-Cycle Space Symposium in 2021, in August of 2021. And as you heard him say yesterday, we're approaching FOC this summer. And it's been amazing to see the command get there. The things that we're able to do now across all fronts, integrating with the other combat commands with our planning, uh, overseeing operations uh, across the globe and thinking in, think of our problems in different ways, becoming a supported combatant command. We actually have active activity right now where other combatant commands are supporting us in terms of understanding an adversary space enabling infrastructure across the globe and what we need to do to, to consider that in a possible future conflict. So we're really thinking hard at U.S. Space Command. We're, we're a command that's dedicated to the space domain, to war fighting, to protecting and defending our capabilities, to perhaps denying adversary capabilities if we need to, and doing what's most important of all, delivering those space capabilities down to the terrestrial domains, to the joint war, war fighters that need them, and all of society. It's a large responsibility. You heard General Dickinson uh, remind us all yesterday of the size of his area of responsibility, which uh, is pretty, really the entire universe minus the Earth and a little atmosphere, right? <laughs> now you'll see on the screen, I like this depiction, because it, you know, that may be, you know, so that's, that's nice to know, right? Well, but reality check, we're focused on our relevant operational space, which is, I think, kind of depicted in this, in this picture from a, a perspective that we don't always think about, right? It's the Earth-Moon system. Yeah, that's the operationally relevant space for us. I gotta tell you, I'm, I'm sorry if you're disappointed. We're not interested in, national security space issues around Saturn yet, but not right now. But we are focused on this, and we're thinking about what that means to protect and defend in our astrographic area of responsibility, right? First one in history. They've all been geographic up to this point. We have an astrographic one. We're thinking about that. You heard General Dickinson talk about how we've tried to um, convey our warfighting requirements, mostly to Space Force, but any service or any organization that can meet those needs that we need. And he talked about the four initial capabilities documents that, that we've released. Um, and the three foundational ones that were, I think, really underpin those are, as he mentioned, are space domain awareness, space command and control, and space combat power. And we've written these ICDs. They're, I, think, I think they're perhaps the, the best of their kind maybe yet written because Number one, they're written, written with warfighting language. And two, they're short. And they're not solution focused. We don't want to dictate a solution. We want to articulate our warfighting need and let the Space Force or other services organizations find out what those solutions are. So we've been thinking hard about that. So what I want to spend the rest of my time talking to you about today is we're going to get a little bit thoughtful here, okay? All right, so hopefully the, you didn't eat too much lunch and you're, you're still, the brains are still got full, are fully blooded. Um, of one of the latest concepts we're thinking about is we foresee, we try to look into the future and see what does space security operations, what does space warfighting look like in our AOR, in our relevant operational space? And this concept I want to talk to you about today is, and I will show the title of my chart of my speech here, Sustained Space Maneuver 
and that's enabling next generation dynamic space operations. All right, that sounds like a really academic thesis title there, but let me pick that apart for you. Let's talk about what do we mean by dynamic space operations? Well, to understand this, you really kind of almost have to forget most of what you know about space mission design. And what I mean by that is what have we done up to date in the space domain with regard to designing our space missions? We have leveraged Kepler and Newton. We've leveraged orbits. They're beautiful things. The sun synchronous orbit, which processes at just the right rate, right, as the, as the Earth's moving around the sun, wonderful orbit. The, the Soviets figured out the Molnaya orbit, you know, a, a low perigee in the southern hemisphere, apogee in the, in the northern hemisphere to kind of really get that coverage when they were worried about our bombers or our missiles coming at them, right? Or, of course, the most wonderful orbit of all, the geosynchronous orbit. Thank you, Arthur C. Clarke. You know, the, the orbit that's, that's period is the same as an Earth rotation. They're wonderful. They're wonderful. They could also be limiting our thinking if we're not careful. All our operations to date have been what I would call Keplerian space operations, or, or even, if you want to think of this way, positional space operations. We put a platform in an orbit, and we pretty much kind of leave it there. You might move it a little bit, right? There might be some repositions in geo. Yeah, I get it. But really, what is it? 99.8% of the time that satellite is not changing its energy configuration and is staying there in that orbit. Yeah, maybe moving 17,000 miles an hour in low Earth orbit, but from Keplerian terms, that thing is staying constant energy, right? Is that hindering our thinking about how we need to do things in the future? Those positional space operations I defined, they actually correlate very, very closely to Earth-facing missions. If your mission has to do with looking down and onto the planet for whatever reason, ISR, COM, so on, it's probably in positional operations. And that's okay. Most of our commercial partners are probably doing positional operations. That's okay. But we have a new class of platforms coming, folks, and there's going to be more and more of them, and the market share is going to grow over time, and those are in-domain platforms whose missions are within the domain itself. Why do those have to be positional? Probably because that's the only way we've ever done it. And we need to be thinking about how we get sustained maneuver some have called this maneuver without regret. I, I don't really like that term anymore. It sounds emotional. I don't want to regret. I don't want to regret, you know, without regret. There shouldn't be any regret. We need to talk about war fighting, sustained maneuver in the domain. How do we think about that? And so these plat anything, and our best platform that I can offer and talk to you about in this setting is our geosynchronous space situation awareness program in geosynchronous orbit. Think about it, folks. This thing, this, these satellites that we have in orbit, they're they don't have an Earth-facing mission. Yeah, we communicate with them, but their job is in the domain. Why do, why, I'll be a little hyperbolic here, why has Space Force given us a satellite that I would really love to maneuver greatly in the domain, but I, it has a fixed fuel tank, and it, it's got a, you know, its lifetime is X years. Well, why is that? Well, what, why does that constrain me? It does constrain us greatly. The best example I can give, and some of you have heard me use this one, but it just works so well, so I'm going to keep on using it. How many people here have, have RVs? Not, not re-entry vehicles, Pete Trainer. <laughs> uh, recreational vehicles. How many of you have? Okay. All right. Now just imagine, all right? Imagine we're in a, a part of the multiverse where you, buy your, you go to buy your RV and, and the, the, the gas tank is not fill, refillable, all right? And you really want to use this thing, right? But you just can't. It may, be a, it may be a huge gas tank, but it's not refillable. And by the way, your family budget doesn't allow you to buy a new one for, say, eight years. Okay? That's important, too. What? Just think about it for a second. You get home to the family. You want to plan the camping trip. And you're like, well, uh, we got this thing's got to last eight years. I got a mission plan over eight years. I got to really be careful about my fuel expenditure. Um, I probably can't make that really long trip, or, 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 or I've just got to be really careful. I can't make a lot of trips. I'm going to have to be really careful from a mission planning perspective. That is actually how we operate GSEP today. It really is. We've got to plan out the, the, the maneuvers and the, and the operations over a long period of time to make sure we budget that correctly. What about mission execution? What about that RV? You finally get on your camping trip and you think, I think I can make it to the campsite 20 miles down the road. We can stay for a couple days and then come back. And that's the only trip I'm going to be able to do for the next six months. Um, how do you execute? 
You know, there was this practice, I, I think it's still going on, but it sure was popular about 10 years ago when hybrid vehicles were, for, were a big thing. It was called hypermileage, right? And, and you would drive your, uh, I was an early adopter of hybrid vehicles, so I'm, I'm one of those, right? And, and you really wanted to get that mileage as high as you could, spend the most time on the battery, not use the gas if you, if, if you really needed to. And so how did you drive? Sort of just really slow accelerations, just tap the brakes, really careful, try to drive that mileage up. Have you been behind a hypermileage driver? <laughs> yeah, you know what I'm talking about. Hey, um, that's how we fly our satellites today. Did you know it? It is. Think about it. Anyone who's done maneuver mission planning, no matter what your, your program was, and we do it for GSAB, but it's for your, that's how we do it, right? You, you, may, you might use a little more gas to get there a little bit faster, but man, you, you know, the engineers, if you're like, I need to get there in the next stage, they come back and say, that's a really bad idea. You're gonna cut the lifetime of this thing down, really bad idea. The RV is gonna stall out, and we'll never get it home, and we'll be stuck. All right, that's how we mission plan. Hey, does that sound like good war fighting operations? Is that how we would want to go into fight in, a, in another domain um, with having to operate under those kinds of restrictions? No, I think we need to change the game. So I'd also like to point out that this is not new. This idea about sustained maneuver has happened before and it will happen again. And let me just take you through a couple of vignettes in history about why, what the importance of maneuver in warfighting and why I think it's inevitable in our domain that we're going to need to be able to do it. So first, let's talk about, there are a lot of land domain examples I could give. I could talk to you about the, the, um, the, the Romans' use of roads, right? I could talk to you about um, the use of, of armor in the 20th century and such. But I'm going to give you an example from Napoleonic times. Napoleon was a genius, right? And, and he leveraged some new kind of ca uh, capabilities and technologies uh, in the early 1800s. Uh, one of them was conscription, right, to generate large armies. But if he had used the logistics methods that existed back then, these armies would have crept along really, really long, really, really long baggage trains and such in order to sustain their maneuver in the field. And, uh, and, 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 and that was the way people did things back then. He found a way to do it differently with the core system. And, you know, I'll say really quickly how that worked. Instead of having one large army that moved in this long train, he actually divided up into pieces and they actually moved away from each other, operated independently, and they didn't rely on bringing all their supplies with them. They actually lived off the land so they could move quickly. They foraged. And then, when necessary, they would converge on an objective. This was a form of maneuver that shocked the rest of Europe. Such sustained maneuver gets you at least three things, right? It allows you to maintain the initiative in the field. It allows you to achieve surprise against your enemy. And when you come in close contact with your enemy, it allows you to outmaneuver the enemy in the field. And trust me, Napoleon's campaigns are littered with successes along this. The Ulm campaign in particular in 1805, if you really get excited, you want to read about this, is where he really surprised the Prussians before the Russians could even get there. You know, they, they never, never knew they were coming and, and uh, uh, came up on them very quickly and then surrounded them and enveloped them and, and won the battle. That was a new way of thinking of maneuver in the land domain, sustained maneuver from a logistics perspective that enabled victory. All right, let's fast forward to the interwar period last, year, uh, last century. You know, um, a brief syllogism here, just as we talk about the word interwar. If you're not currently at war, and two, war is still a thing, then by definition, you're in interwar period. So we're in one now. Unless you think war is not a thing anymore. We can't afford to think that right now in the Department of Defense. But during the interwar period, some interesting technologies were developing um, with regard to carrier aviation and replenishment at sea. There was a need, as the United States Navy did its war gaming in the 1930s, they realized, hey, if we're going to use carrier aviation against a peer adversary, we're going to have to be able to move quickly. We're going to have to strike fast with surprise. We're going to have to do raids with aircraft from our carriers against land targets or maybe sea targets. But then we're going to have to withdraw in a hurry to get out of the way of land-based air that might come searching for us or enemy carriers that might be looking for us. 
right? And that could not be done under the old ways of doing things with coal as a power, as the powering for, for, for uh, naval vessels. Fortunately for the United States Navy, as it's bringing carry aviation along, they also, it's also afforded the opportunity for uh, converting to diesel oil. And that's where the idea of at-sea replenishment really came on strong. In order to be able to do continuous maneuver, sustained maneuver in the maritime domain with your uh, carrier aviation, you needed to be able to replenish your diesel at sea. That way you could continue to operate at high speed and your sortie rate could be high. You didn't have time to go all the way back to port and come back because an adversary would then have the initiative on you if they could succeed and you could not. And it worked. In fact, uh, Admiral Nimitz, after the war was over, said that at sea replenishment was the secret weapon of the US Navy in World War II. It was the able, ability to sustain maneuver of that force in the domain, to continue to maintain the initiative, to achieve surprise, and then to outmaneuver an adversary when they're in, 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 in contact. We've seen it before in the maritime domain. Talk a little bit about logistics in the air domain. We have aerial refueling. Why do we have aerial refueling? Is it to make the, uh, extend the lifetimes of the landing gear of aircraft? They don't have to land and refuel every time? Uh, is it to save money? No, it's to extend the combat capability of those airframes, whether it's, as you saw earlier, you saw B-52, the global reach of a strategic bomber or the tactical loiter time of a fighter. That's why we have aerial refueling. And that has enabled sustained maneuver in the air domain where we needed it. So those are examples from other domains. We do not sustain maneuver in the space domain very well today. What I'm saying to you is we need to find a way to do that. We need to find a way to do that. How do I get it to the point where I don't have to plan out my fuel uh, for a satellite or it has to live for the, long, for the lifetime of, of that satellite? How do I get something from Space Force or anybody who's gonna give me something US Space Command that allows me to sustain maneuver in the domain so that I can maintain initiative, achieve surprise, and outmaneuver an adversary? How do we get there? I actually think that there's two large macro ways. I don't, remember, we're not in the solution business, okay? So, but I'm just saying, I'll, I'll go there just a little bit to kind of, so we can think about it, and maybe there are better solutions out there. The first is the more obvious one. It's kind of what we've been hitting at, right? We need to have on-orbit logistics and servicing capabilities, right? I, if I had the ability to refuel a GSAP uh, regularly, do you think we would operate them any way the, like we do today? We would not. We would be zipping around the geo belt. We'd be trying to keep a potential adversary off balance of where we're going to be today, where we're going to be tomorrow, um, and we'd be we'd be using them. We'd be using them that way, and then we would be we would do sustained maneuver, and then we'd refuel when we needed to. Another way that we could achieve this is through commoditization. Remember, I said it was either um, having the consumable issue or the lifetime issue. They're both the same kind of. Uh, they're both part of the same problem. If I could get a new GSAP every two weeks from Space Force, we would use them a whole lot differently than we do today. A whole lot differently. We'd be able to sustain maneuver, um, and then when we ran out, we would just get another one, right? So if I go back to my RB example, right, I, I can solve that whole problem in that part of the multiverse if I got gas stations to refuel, or if there's no such thing as gas stations and they're fixed fuel tanks, I got a new RV down the road I can pick up every 50 miles or so and just keep on going. Right, then I can probably achieve my, my mission objectives. The concept I'm trying to deliver here is we've been thinking too much, I think, about how we've always done things and not enough about how to think things anew. All of us in our, in our space mission design textbooks, probably that first section says, determine what mission is and then find the best orbit that best positional space operations way to do that mission. That may work for Earth-facing missions, it may work for most commercial missions, it's not gonna work for space warfighting in the future. We gotta do that. You know, there's this great scene in the movie Dead Poets Society with Robin Williams, where he brings the class in, the first day of poetry class, right? And he asks them, okay, read the introduction of the book that they've got, their nice poetry anthology book. And, and, and one of the students is reading it, and, and it's this strange introduction that says how to calculate 
the pleasing value of a poem. And what does Robin Williams uh, do, his character do, say right after the reading that? He says, rip that out of the book. Rip that out of the book. That is not how we're going to think about things. That's not how we're going to do poetry in this class. Well, for those of you that have a space mission design, if it says the only way that you can do, achieve your mission is to find the right order to put something in, rip that out of the book. What we need is a solution to our space, sustained space maneuver problem challenge that we have at U.S. Space Command, and we need to have some solutions delivered to us or all for them. Here are some mistakes that get made in this discussion. All right, and I've already alluded to a few of them. When we, from a space warfighting perspective, talk about um, on-orbit refueling or servicing, the mistakes that made are we're doing it for one of two things. Mistake one is we're doing it to extend the lifetime of the satellite. Hey, that may work for some uh, commercial capabilities, I get that. It may work for some Earth-facing missions. But for dynamic space operations platforms that we want to constantly be maneuvering and not be constrained by that, that's not why we need it, folks. We need it so we can constantly maneuver, so we can maintain initiative, so we can achieve surprise. That's why. The second mistake is we're going to do it to save money. And we're going to, we're going to have this on our that's actually going to save us money. Yeah, you know, as a combat, in the command camp, we don't really care about that, saving money. I just want capability. And if you're telling me that's the only reason you got it, no. We need to solve the sustained space maneuver challenge so that we can have increased combat capability in the domain. And how, do we, how can we get there? You saw a clip shown here of, uh, of, a, of a, a modeling and simulation here of a friendly vessel being attacked by radical commoditized uh, uh, sustained space maneuver platforms. Um, this is what I don't want us to have to face in the future. Here are some predictions. The first is someone's going to get to sustain space maneuver first. Let's let it be us and not somebody else. Second set of predictions here. There will be metrics that we'll develop that will tell us we're on the right track for space, sustained space maneuver. Here's a couple that just off, off the top, top of my head, but, but I'm sure there are better ones. The first is we will measure what percentage of operational life of a platform is spent while maneuvering versus while staying in, in Keplerian status. Right now, as I told you, that's a, right now it's probably 0.01% for almost all of our platforms that are in a maneuvering status for their lifetime. As that starts to change, we'll know that we're getting sustained space maneuver and imposing costs and challenges on our adversary. Here's a second metric or projection. When will we first launch for the first time a platform into space without its fuel tank completely full? We all, oh, you just, you, you just realize, what, why do we, they're only completely full now because we don't know how to service them on orbit. If we had the infrastructure to do that, or we were commoditized properly and we could maybe shrink down the, the, the fuel tank and make these things smaller, then, then, then that would change the equation. We'll know we're on the right track. And lastly, I'll, I would suggest, and by the way, I think uh, Mr. Calvelli is, is completely on the right track and things he's trying to do with his tenants for acquisition are completely in line with solving this particular challenge. I think we'll get into a positive feedback loop, a virtuous circle of sorts, that if we can get infrastructure, I, and I do think our solution set to this problem is probably a blend of a lot of things that we just mentioned, right? It's probably on-orbit servicing and logistics. It's a, kind of some commoditization. It's a blending of all these things. But when that comes to fruition, we will have driven to a lot of the things he's after, smaller platforms, right? If I can refuel or the lifetime of this platform is really, really short, it's probably going to be a lot smaller. And that's going to enable me to be more maneuver, have sustained maneuver in the domain. It's also going to impose a greater cost and adversary to track and see these things, and it's just going to have a positive feedback mechanism. So if we have this vision and we can get there, I think it starts to kind of fill in its own blanks and we get there faster. So I hope I've given you something to think about today, all right? Sustained space maneuver is kind of what we're calling it right now at U.S. Space Command. We've actually issued 
some RFIs to our government partners on this, and some of you have seen these, and even industry, I think you're probably, some of you are tracking this, that tries to drive a requirement for this. And how do we get there and how do we do it quickly? And it's got two pieces to it. The first is we want to do an operational demonstration of sustained maneuver and how we would either commoditize or just come to the solution. Maybe it's something beyond commoditization or on-orbit servicing uh, and replacement of consumables, which, by the way, could be fuel or other things, right? Um, we want to do a demo by 2026. And then we want to achieve the goal before this decade is out of having sustained space maneuver solutions for all of our dynamic space operations platforms. Gang, I've only given you GSAP today as an example. There are more platforms coming that fit that category in the domain. There are more coming. And the need for them to be able to have sustained space maneuver is likely to be even greater than what I've described to you with GSAP. It's just what I could talk to you about today. I'm optimistic we're going to get there. I hope this was thoughtful uh, in a way and made you sort of think about how do we question some assumptions? Where do we think we're going with space warfighting? These are the things we're thinking about at US Space Command right now. It's a pretty exciting time. It's a great time to be part of it. I hope you can all be part of, a, of the solution and part of the broader team here in the third space age. Thanks so much for your time today.